You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production in association with City News. In the wake of the recent federal budget, there has been a very bright spotlight placed directly on the housing affordability crisis in Canada. Unfortunately, for the federal government that authored the budget, much of that spotlight is focused on how little the promises in the document will actually accomplish. And the person hogging most of the spotlight is the Prime Minister's biggest rival. Conservative leadership hopeful Pierre Polyev released a video this week. That's not necessarily news. This man releases partisan videos as naturally as other politicians breathe. However, what was notable about this video is the emotion that it has stirred up among hundreds of thousands of Canadians left behind by housing prices. Back when this was built, it's probably a family with a very modest income could have afforded that piece of heaven for themselves. In this episode, we'll get into the policies Polyev proposes and if they'll actually do anything to help the crisis. But to begin with, they don't actually matter all that much. The video is a perfect appeal to emotion. It's a warm plea for a time when any ordinary Canadian with a job could own a home. Whether or not that ever was possible, whether or not that ever will be possible again, that doesn't matter either. Polyev is Trudeau's biggest challenger. And if he can turn the housing issue against the government, he'll have a powerful weapon whenever Canadians next go to the polls. He knows this. In the meantime, though, Canadians of all political stripes will continue to be unable to afford a home or even, in many cases, to rent one. And the crisis will worsen. So who actually has plans that would fix this? Does any government, at any level, have the will to follow through on what it would actually take to change things? Is it a good thing or not that housing has become such a contentious political issue? And finally, who exactly does deserve to be able to afford to buy a home in Canada in this day and age? Anyone with a job? Is that still possible? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Leilani Farha is the global director of The Shift, an organization that recognizes housing as a human right, not as a commodity or an extractive industry. Hey, Leilani. Nice to talk to you again. It's nice to be here. Why don't you start, and and I know this is probably a, a big question to begin with, but how would you describe the scale of the affordable housing crisis in Canada right now? It is an acute crisis. And I don't like to use the term crisis too lightly. It's not great if like everything is a crisis. Mm -hmm. But when you have the average price of a home in, let's say, Toronto being $1.2 million, when you have tenants across the country at least something like 950,000 households living in accommodation that they're having trouble meeting the cost of, that's pretty sizable uh, in a country that's wealthy like Canada and that really uh, could be performing differently. And, And so I think that we have an acute crisis on our hands. I mean, nothing is affordable nowhere Hmm. Is it affordable? Even in secondary cities, you know, you're, we're hearing that the cost of housing, both home ownership and rental, is very, very high. So it's it's across the nation, definitely what I would call a crisis. So today we're going to talk about the affordable housing crisis, as I mentioned, and affordable home ownership for Canadians, which is a huge political issue right now. But before we begin with that, you know, we've talked to you about, I guess, another housing crisis, which is which is homelessness in our cities. Are those two connected and how? 
Yeah, and and sorry, in in terms of the scale of the crisis, I should have absolutely referenced homelessness. We know that there's anywhere around 235,000 people who live in homelessness, you know, in any given year in Canada. And I actually think that figure is growing. And I do see a relationship between the unaffordability of rental accommodation and homelessness. We're starting to see, and and you see media interviews and news stories coming out revealing this, a new class of homeless people is growing, and that's people who are working and students. Mm -hmm. And so these are people who we wouldn't normally expect to see living in homelessness, but they're working maybe two, three minimum wage jobs, maybe just a regular job, but they can't afford either their rent maybe in some cases mortgage payments, and then then they couldn't afford the rent and right. et cetera. And of course, students are in a very difficult situation with tuition being very high, student debts being very high, and there being very little affordable housing for students in cities uh, across the country. So there's a direct relationship um, that needs to be better documented probably, uh, but it's definitely there. When I when I speak to people living in homelessness, they were all housed at some point right. and many of them have jobs uh, or are in school. So this is worrying to me. Um, we're entering like new terrain, I think. In terms of affordable housing, um, home ownership or, or rental, You know, we're having this conversation in April of 2022. This is not a new crisis. This has been uh, something we've talked about on this podcast for years, something that Canadians have indicated uh, is a huge issue for them for years now. Can you maybe quickly outline what, if anything, um, we've tried as a country to combat this so far? (laughs) We, we haven't tried anything. Um, that's a short answer. Look, I, I think that the way laws and policies are structured in the country across the board have enabled unaffordability. So, I mean, it depends, you know, where do you want me to take you? Do you want me to take you back to the Mulroney years when he was prime minister and he started instituting a neoliberal agenda, which had government receding from the provision of deeply affordable social housing and liberalized tenant protections, in other words, making tenant protections weaker? Hmm. Or do you want me to move forward to the era where post-global financial crisis, where real estate investment trusts were granted the ability to avoid corporate taxes. Real estate investment trusts are uh, one of the vehicles uh, that's leading to unaffordability. They purchase big multi-family apartment buildings and their business model is one that requires them to raise rents for a variety of reasons, which we can get into, um, but basically to satisfy their investor shareholder interests. And so the fact that they don't pay corporate tax enables them, it buttresses their 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 activities. Do you want me to take you to the pandemic and the Bank of Canada setting interest rates so low that money was basically free? And that's particularly attractive for institutional investors who are invading the housing and residential real estate landscape and pushing rents up, as well as individual investors who are buying now and leveraging, you know, so that they can buy three, four or five properties. Hmm. So that's the landscape that we exist in. So I would say very little has been done to ensure affordability, ensure the lowest income people, people in receipt of social assistance, people working minimum wage, wage jobs would have access to affordable and secure housing. I don't, I, I, I really think the landscape has been cultivated for other actors, particularly financial actors. Housing highlighted, theoretically at least, the federal budget last week. Can you just quickly outline what's in there? I know we talked about it on this show last week, but from your perspective, what's in there? And and I guess, will it help? So in it, there was a fair bit on trying to curb speculation. 
And then there were some supply side measures. And then there were some measures to support buyers. And if I look at it as a whole without breaking it down into too much detail, what I will say is I think they've missed the mark. So what they've done is they've gone after foreign buyers, right? A two-year ban on foreign buyers. There's an anti-flipping tax. Uh, This is all in the speculation area, right? Those are the two big ones. And there's this other one that's kind of complicated and I hope we don't have to get into about assigning um, the sales of newly constructed homes and and taxing that. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's the on the speculation side. So I think they missed the mark on the speculation side. I think banning foreign buyers, I'm not sure why they felt they should go after foreign buyers in particular. Um, They represent, as I understand it, about 5% of Canada's market. Studies out of British Columbia where they didn't ban foreign buyers, but they, you know, British Columbia had a big tax, 15%, and then I think it was raised to 20%. And they managed to raise a fair bit of money through that tax. Hmm. But, you know, taxing ends up canceling itself out, obviously, because if it reduces the foreign buyers to zero, then you lose, you no longer get the benefits of that tax. But by banning foreign buyers, the government didn't even avail itself of any monies it could have, right? By taxing like BC did. And then it also sort of focuses on the nature of of the purchaser being outside of Canada. But we know that purchasers are very sophisticated now. Institutional investors are very sophisticated and there are ways they can easily look domestic. Right. And so if you really understand capital flows and how this all works and how smart some of the investors are, you know that they will get around this. So I I query why they didn't go after real estate investment trusts. Uh, They make up 20% of, at least, Mm. of our market. Interesting. What they said about real estate investment trusts is, we're going to study that. Now, they didn't study foreign buyers, it seems to me, and, and, and yet they move forward on foreign buyers. Now they're saying they want to study real estate investment trusts, and yet there's been a lot of studies of real estate investment trusts. Martine August is an expert in the area, academic expert. There's been grassroots studies. There's tenant movements, et cetera. So, so I think that was a bit strange. Add to it that they undertook a whole bunch of supply side measures they have the housing accelerator fund um doubling the the pace of home building in canada mm-hmm. In the next decade or so, they have um, a home renovation tax credit. And then add to that, they have support for buyers. It suggests to me that they're still stuck in the same mode that has, in fact, caused the crisis. That is creating supply, but not supply for people most in need, just supply generally. Right. And enticing people to buy, which heats up markets. (laughs) So um, I'm being a bit shorthanded here, but only to say if they were really serious about tackling the housing crisis and particularly affordability, I would have expected to see REITs come under some pressure. I would have expected to see very targeted supply with an understanding that, you know, We need to do an audit of what exists in the country and where need exists and that need is what should be targeted. People at the lowest end of the income spectrum in particular, I wouldn't have imagined so much emphasis on support for buyers. In a moment, I'll ask you about uh, what the opposition has to say about that, but maybe first, just quickly... This is obviously an issue the federal government is vulnerable on, provincial governments, municipalities. Like, it's it's a really hot-button topic. It's clearly very also emotional for many Canadians who see their future in this. Is there a danger to this becoming politicized? Um, and by that, I guess I just mean, like, a, a battlefield on which the various parties go to war. Well, I don't know if that's a danger. I mean— I want the political parties to really grapple with this and try to come up with real solutions. Yes, there is a danger that what will end up happening is they'll just simply each try to represent the interests of those who support their party. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the, the liberals have 
real estate and finance supporting them and so do the conservatives and and developers, right? So yeah, I mean, there's that risk. But I like a heated debate about housing because this country has actually been facing a housing crisis for some time. And I don't think the rigor that's required has been there. Um, The other thing I would say is, you know, the liberals enacted legislation recognizing housing is a fundamental human right and that that should be incorporated into federal housing policy. And so I would like to see the NDP, if not the conservatives, trying to hold the liberals accountable to that commitment through housing policy, monetary policy, and fiscal policy. I mean, that would be an amazing outcome <laughs> if one of the parties, and I guess the NDP are the most likely candidates, let's let's face it, if they actually held the Liberals' feet to the fire in this new coalition that they have to say, you know, we're actually not going to meet the outcomes that you set for yourselves when you said... Um, housing is a human right. right because you know when when you understand housing as a human right, you have to effectively at- tackle affordability. You have to immediately address homelessness, and that requires a good long look at real estate investment trusts, at the central bank setting of interest rates, various uh, tax incentives, etc., offered to some of the big players. So. Yeah. So I don't know how worried I am at this point. I think it's interesting. And if you look at other countries, I mean, housing is often um, an issue of political debate. Before we move on to potential solutions, I want to ask you, did you see uh, conservative leadership hopeful Pierre Polyev's uh, video about uh, a little house in Vancouver? I did. Government gatekeepers protect the wealthy. They get wealthier and wealthier by the day as their limited and scarce property goes up in value. But the working class person who can't actually pay his or her bills, let alone save for a mortgage, finds their purchasing power go down and down. Their wages are actually worth less. Yeah, so here's here's the thing about this, and this is why I asked about the issue becoming politicized. Um, Say what you want about the Conservative Party, but that message really resonated with a lot of people. And I'm talking about people beyond his, what you would consider his target audience. Um, What is he actually proposing in his video? And what are the ramifications of it? And like, I guess my main question is, and you don't have to complicate it, but, but is that, does he have potential solutions and will people flock to them? Yeah, so I think... Mr. Polyavra um, diagnosed the problem fairly well, to be honest. I mean, I wouldn't have used the language he used, and I might have I might have told a slightly different story. But what he says as he's standing outside this little shack of a home, right? He says basically, you know, this home is worth five million dollars. Will be sold for, you know, has a value of five million dollars, and. You're, you're sort of incredulous, you're like you're looking at this little shack. And we've seen this before in Toronto. I mean, these sorts of things happen all the, you know, we see see these images. What I would have said is that we are living in the, in a fictitious era. You know, there's no way that that home has a value of $5 million, right? That's a fiction that's been created through housing markets and the way housing markets run. But nevertheless, I think that it was powerful what he did. And I think people will would respond well to that, like the in- incredulity, right? Like, whoa, how is that possible? And and then he also says, right, money's been too cheap, thanks to the Bank of Canada setting, in particular, setting interest rates so low. So I think in that way, he, he kind of got it right. I don't think he offers any reasonable solutions. And that's what's more difficult about something like his video, because unless you kind of dig deep and know a little bit It's very easy to say supply is the answer. Supply, supply, supply. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why he thinks supply is going to help. He didn't use any facts in his video about supply in this country. You know, everyone's running around saying, oh, you know, Canada has um, the worst performance in terms of per capita housing of the G7. 
But if you look at Canada's performance amidst OECD countries, we're actually not that bad in terms of supply. I think Stats Canada just recently came out with some figures that indicated that, in fact, our supply has been outpacing uh, population growth, except in the Atlantic provinces. And so, in fact, we don't necessarily have a huge supply issue. We also have 1.3 million homes that are standing vacant, right? (laughs) So we've got supply. And what we don't have is affordable supply for those in need. So I don't see why building, building, building is going to answer that without targeted building, building that is aimed at those who are on low income, those who are working minimum wage jobs, those who are in precarious housing situation. And, you know, Budget 2022 allocated a huge amount of money for these one-off $500 payments. I think it was like $450 million for one-off $500 payments to to households that are struggling to pay the rent. Well, if you divide $450 million by $500, what you end up with is 950,000 households struggling to pay rent or make housing payments, right? So so supply, just general supply isn't going to help. And that's what Mr. Polyever seems to be suggesting. So what's the solution to that then? Because one thing I keep tripping over is... Which level of government can fix this and how? Like, and I'm I'm not asking you to give a, a, a fully formed plan, but like, who's got the power to start tackling this and what do they do tomorrow? I think you got that right. We need all orders of government engaged in this. And, you know, people critique me when I say I think we need a multi-stakeholder table to tackle the housing crisis in this country. And it would involve all levels of government, indigenous governments and representation. It should involve the private sector. It should involve grassroots movements as well, tenant organizers, the the folks who are living the reality. I get critiqued because it's like, oh God, we don't need more talk. Well, I'm not so sure about that. I think we do need some new conversations about this. I think human rights actually offers a very interesting framework when you're confronted with the kind of housing crisis Canada has on its hands, when you've got rising levels of homelessness and new populations of folks who are homeless, when you've got unaffordability in the rental market and when you have home ownership that is not a a possibility for young people, for newcomers, for, you know, big swaths of the population. I think we need new conversations. And, you know, I feel very strongly that cities are on the front line of of this, front lines of this, and uh, don't have the capacity, resources, know-how, et cetera, to deal with it. And then you get provincial governments that have legislative power to protect tenants and aren't doing a good enough job in that regard. You know, then you have the federal government with lots of dollars, but the same old, same old ideas, thinking that they can um, use supply as the way out. So, I mean, no, I don't have a silver bullet. No one does. Mm -hmm. But I do think that there has to be better coordination between the different levels of government. Let me ask a somewhat adversarial question, but one that I think is a typical one uh, when you're talking about why, you know, not much gets done at the federal level or by politicians. And that is, look, I own a house in Toronto, uh, probably paid more than we could afford for it at the time, but, but we're lucky. And is there really a way to make housing more accessible for everyone in cities like Toronto uh, without crushing the value uh, that families have put into really, really expensive houses in big cities. And and listen, in many cases, those families are relying on the value of those homes to, to fund their retirement. <laughs> yeah, it's such a good question. And, you know, there's um, an inherent contradiction. So, People want to treat housing like a commodity. And then when it performs like a commodity, in other words, you may win or you may lose by investing in that commodity, people get all nervous. Hmm. I mean, 
If you're going to use housing that way, you have to expect it to perform like a commodity. You invest in gold, gold goes up, gold goes down. Hmm. I think what's even more disturbing to people is that governments and banks might have a hand in devaluing it, right? Right. Um, And that's fair because governments haven't given a lot of households options for how to have economic security. We don't have the kinds of employment opportunities that we used to with good pensions, for example, especially for young people, right? Look at the employment circumstances for young people. And we don't have other things to invest in that provide us with security. Successive governments in this country have relied on housing and the construction industry for economic growth. It's a huge part of our GDP. And as a result, it means they haven't done other things. Like, where is Canada on research and development? Look at when the pandemic hit, where Canada was at in terms of research and development in the pharmaceutical industry, right? We were nowhere. We were not on the map. We had exported that. You know, it's no longer a business in Canada. And so I think these are the big conversations that need to be had. Like, what course are we on? And I really like, I don't know if you've heard of the economist, Mariana Mazzucato. She's now a friend and I've read a lot of her work. And she, she asks us to think about two things with respect to our economies that I think is really would be great in the conversation about housing and the economy. She says, you know, what values is your economy based in? Mm -hmm. And what value do you want to attribute to your economy or take out of your economy? And I love that idea of like thinking about our economies from a values place, right? Value and values. And I think, you know, Canada's history is very clear that housing has been viewed as Uh, a way to grow our economy and has been less about the value of housing as home, uh, as a place to grow families and all that nice, warm stuff. That's a great point. And, you know, for the record, we bought this house. It's my forever home. So if it goes down, it goes down. Um, And I know not a lot of people see it that way. Here's my last question, though, because we've talked before about housing as a human right. And that is, you know, everything from unhoused people to renters to et cetera, et cetera. But what I've seen, and this gets back to uh, Polyev's video, what I've seen lately in the political messaging is talking a little bit differently about kind of home ownership as a human right. You know, there's this yeah. there's this message that a traditional family with one solid income and two kids should be able to afford a house in Canada. From your perspective, is that true? And who really should be able to not live in a house, but own a home in this country? Yeah, so... The international human right to housing absolutely does not say that everyone has the right to home ownership. So, you know, the right to housing is the right to live in peace, security, and with dignity. Right. It is not prescriptive in that way as to what tenure you might have. Um, So home ownership is just a kind of tenure. It just says that you must have secure tenure and that housing should be affordable. It should be habitable. It should be in a good location. But it absolutely does not say you have the right to home ownership. And I did note that in Mr. uh, Poliever's video. Um, So that's just not correct. It's just simply not correct. But ownership's kind of become like the holy grail of of housing in Canada, even though, you know, in the past, like, there were tons of renters, right? Well, it's it's funny. It is the holy grail, but our cities are moving toward, you know, I think Vancouver has more than 50% of renters um, right now. So home ownership is lower. And I mean, here's the thing. I think there was a Canada of yesteryear in the 70s into the 80s where there were a lot of housing options. So if you had a high enough income that wasn't too high, you could afford to buy a home. and If you wanted to rent, there were rental accommodation that was available. And if you really were very low income, there was social housing that was available uh, or cooperative housing in some cases. So and I think I think that's a reasonable thing for a nation to aspire to a multiplicity of opportunities for people in various and diverse circumstances. Right. So I think that's a reasonable goal. 
as to whether every single person has a right to home ownership, I, you know, I query that. If you look in other countries in Europe, for example, I mean, you know, renting is is considered the norm in some places like Berlin, you know, more than 80% of the, the population rents and home ownership is really kind of a, a, an outlier. But that's based in culture as well. Vienna is the same, right? So, But that's based in a culture that's cultivated by governments and by the people themselves. And we're not there right now in Canada. So I do think it would be wise to start cultivating different cultures, not just around the normal ones, you know, home ownership, rental, social, But what about, you know, other kinds of tenure systems? Land trusts are becoming increasingly popular. What about cooperatives, et cetera? So obviously right now it's just simply unrealistic because I think the average cost of a home across the country is like 700,000. So obviously it's just, that's a pipe dream for so many people. What makes renting palatable in other places, in other systems, is good tenant protections. Right. Leases that are longer where the person wants a longer lease, like five-year leases, caps on rent increases, you know, rent freezes, those sorts of things, really healthy legislative support for tenants. Of course, people don't want to be a tenant in Canada, where we have pretty weak tenant legislation across the country, right? Right. That's not, (laughs) why would you want to rent? It's it's just simply insecure. So a lot would have to be fixed to to create the kind of opportunities um, that I'm suggesting, diverse opportunities. Leilani, thank you so much for this. Uh, Fascinating as always, really appreciate the time. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Leilani Farha, Global Director of The Shift. That was The Big Story. For more from us, including lots of coverage on the housing crisis, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can talk to us and tell us why Polyev is totally right, Trudeau is totally wrong, or vice versa on Twitter at thebigstoryfpn. I promise you can choose either one. Someone will agree with you. And you can write us letters. If you must, send a long screed refuting every point our guest made. I promise I'll read the whole thing. The address is hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can find this podcast in Apple, Google, Stitcher, Spotify, Pocket Cast, CastBox, you pick one, it's there. You can ask your smart speaker to play it by saying, play The Big Story Podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow. <laughs>